Most of you know our next speaker, Johnny Ockstein, who will be coming before us here and bringing another good lesson as we study how to remain faithful to Christ, how to remain a faithful Christian. And Johnny's going to bring us a lesson on keep a humble and teachable mind that is ready to repent of any sin. And that's certainly the, the key to remaining faithful. Um, he's been preaching in San Mateo, California congregation for 18 years. He's married uh, 30 years to the former Pam, Pamela Joan Hackworth. Uh, has a daughter, Leslie, and who's married to Jeremy Hicks and living in San Mateo. Uh, son Andrew is a senior at UC Berkeley. I think comments were made about that last time he's introduced. But uh, Johnny graduated with a business degree out of the University of North Carolina, and preaching meetings. In Cal he's preaching meetings in California, Texas, Nevada, Florida, and be, uh, as I understand it, co-directing the English lectures in, in uh, England. Um, making sure there's no styrofoam cups up here. <laughs> Johnny's going to bring us this good lesson. I pray that all of us will be attentive as, and on this very important subject of remaining faithful to God. Thank you. The humble and teachable mind part of it is dedicated to uh, Terry Hightower. The subject this afternoon, keep a humble and teachable mind that is ready to repent of any sin. The verses that David selected to address, uh, James 1, 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The other passage, 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. An interesting question was asked by our Lord. Matthew 21, verse 28, the occasion of which was one in which the Lord was engaged in instructing the chief priests and the elders by means of a parable. The difference between saying one will obey and actually obeying. The question itself, what think ye, is one that continues to penetrate and for us remains contemporaneous, relevant, questioning what do you think? And I guess we could also, along with that, ask how you think or even do you think and in the life of the Christian uh, sometimes I'm sure elders ask members that when they do certain things that they shouldn't what were you thinking were you thinking and maybe sometimes they want to ask us will you ever think but when you have that question presented to you, it is one which always is a cause for reflection because it demands a response. And then you have to think about that. What am I thinking? There is a consequence, of course, to that answer. When asked for an interpretation or an assessment, we are then push to work in our minds for a reasonable answer. Sometimes beforehand, we may not have ever taken the time to think about or clarify our thoughts around a given topic or subject. And now someone has asked, what do you think about this? And then you have to think about it. I know that in some instances, people will talk to you or uh, about just about anything unless you ask them a question about the Bible. Sometimes even brethren. They'll, they'll talk with you about anything and then you'll say, do you remember that 
from Second Chronicles, and, 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 and then they don't really remember. Without every action or thought, are we thinking through a biblical filter, with biblical authority, so as to allow the Word of God to determine our actions, or have we resolved to make our own decisions, direct our own paths? An excellent illustration of this is found in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16. Verses 19 through 31, you are very familiar with this story. But here we see a man who had lived quite well. He dressed well. Ate well. He lived quite well. But he had not given any thought to his eternal destination. When he does begin to think about his circumstances, it's too late. Oftentimes we hear stories about young people. And these young people make decisions and take actions in their life that sometimes bring them to an abrupt close. You hear about young people getting in automobile accidents, young people going to concerts, taking drugs, and, and dying. Well, this man, he is reminded in the passage of Luke of his pleasurable but spiritually barren life and the undesirable but now eternal torment that he now has. Considering that eternity rests in the balance, we should proceed cautiously and with proper instructions from God above so as to ensure that our eternal location is with the Father and Son and not with the Prince of Darkness. I know that you know quite well that Satan has his eyes on every one of you, every one of us. There are a lot of people that Satan is not really concerned about right now, but he is concerned about every one of us who are attending this lectureship. To the Lord's question might be asked, have we given any thought so as to deepen our level of critical inquiry and reveal a more honest and unfettered response to the serious matters in life? Man has often taken life carelessly and for granted and acted in such a way to jeopardize the soul that God has given him. Again, as we go back to the story in Luke 16, the rich man does not want his brothers to carelessly live as he had, and he, he begs that someone warn them of their impending doom if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets. James, in the first chapter of his book, verse 21, speaks of how we have received the word of God, it is our guiding force in this life. Do we inject it with some of our own will so that we can go our own way and do our own thing? You know, years ago, a popular group of brothers, the Isleys, sang that song, It's Your Thing. Do what you want to do. And of course, Mr. Blue Eyes himself did it his way. Well, I think the rich man was doing it his way. And look where it got him. I guess the question is, are we honest and sincere enough to confess our sins to God 
who already knows what we have need of before we ask? Do we delude ourselves into imagining that some inner harbor of safety awaits? There are many false teachers who will tell you you do not have to worry about what you do in this life. There is no consequence. There is no hell. Or it may just be for a few minutes. And then it's all extinguished. One of the most important characteristics or learned traits for a Christian to have in his service to God is a humble and teachable mind. And that can only be accomplished through a continual renewing of that mind. Romans 12.12 12, Indicating that there is a change for the better. Something superior is accomplished solely by the relationship one has and maintains with God. We do not get better without him. There are a lot of things in this life that we can do. But our lives especially and certainly our spiritual lives will never be better without him without listening to him, without obeying him, without assimilating what we have through the revealed word in our daily lives. Without God, we are, according to Romans, subject to the transformational powers of, the world, of this world's darkness. There are only two influences in this life. The influence of God and the influence of Satan. Those are the only two influences. Romans warns against our being sculpted to the shape of its dark ideologies and philosophical con conceits or whims. And we no longer find ourselves capable of discerning truth or resisting error. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we see God's, man, uh, God's plan for man revealed. We are created in his image as the culmination of the creation process. God, from the dust of the ground, made man and breathed into Adam the breath of life. That is our humble beginning. At that very moment, when we think about this, we became living souls. And with that, an inherent obligation and everlasting gratitude to our Creator. God brought us, brought us into this world and that fact should dissolve any intimation we might have of arrogance or pride. Where would we be were we not created by God? Nowhere. I don't think people really think about that very much. But this has not prevented man from forgetting or simply dismissing the reality of his having been created by Almighty God. Some cases, even, even hardening their hearts of those who would overlook the scriptures and acknowledging this outpouring of love and grace. Look at the attitudes of people in the world today. A few weeks ago when the, this debate that was uh, streamed over the internet between Bill Nye and Mr. Ham of the Creation Museum, I went on a few websites, not so much to ruminate over the debate, but to see the comments. And the comments on various websites, the, the, the the venom and hatred spewed out toward anyone who could possibly believe in God. The 
book of Psalms 100, verse 3. And I'm sure that you have read this many times, but I think it is one of the more beautiful verses to read at this particular point. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. This reference, as I note in the manuscript, is vital because... It performs the necessary function of reminding us not only of our beginnings, but also that without the Lord we would not even exist. It tells us what our attitudinal position before the Lord God should be. That we should view our existence thanksgiving with praise. The psalmist tells us, He made us. You did not develop in a can of soup or a pool of spit. Though the way some people act, you would question that. We did not self-create ourselves or the universe in which we live, breathe, and have our very being. And for this, we should be ever thankful unto him and bless his name. Since our creation, God has provided us with a path to walk before him that would allow us to return to our creator once our physical bodies are overtaken in death. Or in the day that the Lord Jesus descends with his angels, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. I don't think people like to hear those verses. They're too real. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel. That's most of the people who have walked on this earth. Those who, as mentioned above, know not God, a choice they have elected to abide by and obey not the gospel, the results of their open and hostile resistance to truth are not exempted from the law of God. Some people think that if they don't believe in God, don't believe the Bible, that nothing's going to happen to them. It's only going to happen to us. Romans 1, 19 and 20. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. However, as man became aware of his status before God as a result of his actions, he drew away from God rather than closer to him. Our vanity has eviscerated any hope of humility and we set ourselves on a road to perdition. At various times in the scriptures we see man seeking to direct his own path with his feet running toward that which is evil. Proverbs 1:15. No longer giving God the reverence that is deserved, nor showing the requisite fear of his wrath. We see man following the most despised character flaw possible, that of pride. You know, around the country, the last weekend of June, in many of the largest cities, and I'm sure 
in Houston or Austin, there is homosexual pride day. They call it gay pride. I'm not giving them that word. And they think that that's just cute. Our pride could not mask with, that we were willfully ignorant of the righteousness our Heavenly Father made possible through the gospel. And though he had given us all things that would align us or that pertain to life and godliness, we rejected his offer, created for ourselves and our delusion a string of lies separating us from him. Romans 1, 21 through 25 speaks of man not glorifying him as God and neither were thankful. Became futile in their thoughts. And as we know, man today professing to be wise show themselves to be fools. They have attempted to change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. In the book of Job, chapter 37, we have an example there. One of Job's friends who says, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still. Consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge? How the garments are warm and when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, just as a molten looking glass? Teach us what we shall say to him. For we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. That is exactly what we should say to many of the people in the world today. Here the words of Elihu are an apt introduction to our understanding and our humble beginnings. We, man, mankind, has become a proud race. No longer listening to, no longer hearkening to, no longer putting ourselves in subjection to the one who created us. We are like unthankful and ungrateful children. You see much of this in the world today. Parents who do the very best they can. Brother Lee was speaking about this from a different perspective. But parents who try to do the very best for their children, who work hard, who provide food on, their, on the table, shelter, warm homes, and clothing. And how sometimes you see those children have very little concern and gratitude for the work that their parents have done. And that's how mankind has been acting toward the most holy God. It is in the next chapter, in chapter 38, the question comes, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. I didn't think it was going that well. It's bubbling back here, buddy. <clears throat> Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? That's a very good question. For those of us who think we're so smart, for those of us who think that, that we have all the answers, and I'm, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about the people that you deal with on a regular basis. I'm talking about the people that you invite to Bible classes and worship services and try to teach the, the gospel so that their souls may be saved. 
Those people who sit in the ivory towers of universities who think that they have the answer. I was looking at one of those videos and some professor, and I have to use that term in this particular case uh, pejoratively, he said that we came from fish and that we were still fish. Now, how can you take a person like that seriously? <laughs> he sat there as if he were proud of that answer. But when we listen to the words that came into the ears and mind of Job, we can easily discern the irony of the Lord's words as he's saying, surely you know, Job, how all this happened. You, you surely can explain it to me. Were you present at the creation? An obvious impossibility. But he's worrying about God's management of the vast expanses here. Now Job, an earthbound man as we all are, he had for a moment lost sight of who his creator is. We can't do that. That's why we must have a humble and teachable mind so that we don't lose sight not only of our goal of reaching that eternal, glorious, heavenly home, but that we might also, as we walk through this life, do so humbly and meekly, having the mind of Christ. Job was learning this lesson we read in chapter 40, verses 4 and 5, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. He has learned. And this clarity of mind comes in a broader focus when Consideration is given to the larger reality of creation and existence. Rather than what one's own mind has been able to surmise from limited knowledge and experience. When we were in England, and I think uh, there, were quite a, there were a number of members here on that trip, we went into this uh, little evolution tent that they had out in Kew Gardens. And they so proudly displayed the little bubbling pools that we were supposed to have come out of. And the fact that people believe this and think that this, this is why mankind is so haughty at this point. So proud of their supposed knowledge, so willing to accept the mob mentality of Darwinian evolution, to throw off the responsibility of obedience to God. God challenges Job's perception of his governance of the world by opening with those words, Who is this? God again Excerpts and asserts his superiority. Job's limited understanding hinders him from disputing with his creator about his own fate. And this inherent danger of being and basing our self-defense on our own personal integrity. That pride may arise and pervert our thinking. Yesterday, but we've had so many lessons, it might have been the day. One of the brethren, and I can't even remember, I'm sure I'll be told later, 
It says, we think quite a bit of ourselves. We like ourselves. We do. We like ourselves. We think a lot of our own opinions. We value our own mind's ability to determine what we will do or not do. And that's true. Very seldom do we go to a friend and ask them, tell me what to do, and then do it. We might want them to tell us what we've already decided to do. But we rarely listen to someone else. This realization, the need to be humble and teachable before God is a recurring theme throughout the scriptures. And the example of Job is just one. We come before him as our creator. We acknowledge him as our sovereign Lord, seeing in the story of Job an opportunity for man to exalt himself and view his circumstances as above the reproach, and that is commonplace. We could speak of the tower that man attempted to build to reach up into the heavens. In our world today, men are often less likely to find the necessary humility before God that Job wisely exhibited. We would do well to cogitate what James is saying in verse 21, verse 21 of chapter 1, to lay apart, to put away, to rid ourselves of all vice and moral defilement or corruptions, all vulgarity that might be entertained, and to receive a gift which demands humility and acceptance. To lay apart, to separate ourselves from anything that makes a person unclean and therefore unacceptable to God. There are people who think that it's my body and I'll do what I please. If I want to smoke cigarettes and die of cancer, that's my decision. If I want to shoot drugs, if I want to drink alcohol, who should tell me no? God already has. The question is, do we listen? Instead, one is to exercise meekness, which is indeed important in the passage. Not so much because of its contrast to anger, but because it is the attitude of those who are God's poor in spirit and reflective of the kind of disposition needed in both hearing and doing the word. The gospel, if obeyed, is able to save a person's soul, change a person's life, that is the understanding that God desires of his disciple, that the God who regenerates, begets the Christian by the word of truth will save him by the same word implanted in him if he humbly and sincerely receives it. What have been some of the responses that you had to pe from people when you try to teach them the gospel? I don't have time for this. I can't believe that you really believe this. In such a short time, do you expect me to become a Christian? This world is moving at a very fast pace. And it's very, very difficult now to find people who are willing to sit and listen or sit and read or sit and think about the word of God and the effect that it has not only on the life that they are living at this present time on this earth, but their eternal destination. Again, we think of the rich man who for so long in his life only enjoyed the pleasures of that life. But ever since 
ever since that moment that he died, he has been in torment. And he has a long time to go. Forever. We pass through time and we sometimes don't even consider how precious this time is, this life is. We continue to fill this life with the things that we enjoy and rarely do we see people giving the time to thank God for the things that we receive. Sometimes you see people in the world, they come into a restaurant or you have them, uh, not you would have them over to your house because it would change, I'm sure, but they go someplace to eat, they sit, they get their food, they sit down and they start stuffing their face. They haven't thought about the fact that were it not for God, they wouldn't be able to eat that food. They wouldn't be giving thanks to God. And yet we, when we go, before we eat, when you have people into your homes, pause for a moment, a, a moment to thank God. And we thank him not only for the food that we receive, as we usually say, for the nourishment of our bodies, and it goes on in different ways. But we're thankful for the breath of life. We're thankful for the measure of health. We're thankful for the sun who died for us. We should always be ready to repent. What if despite all the help that God offers us, we stumble? What if we fall into sin? God remains steadfast, waiting to forgive us when we repent. John tells us in the aforementioned verse, John, in 1 John 1 and 9, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We should be so thankful to God that that verse is in the New Testament. Anytime that we are willing to honestly confess a sin and genuinely repent of it, we can know the blessedness of of forgiveness from a faithful God. In the book of Psalms, 32 verses 1 through 5, Blessed is he who trans, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. The scriptures have so much to say on the subject of sin. It transgresses the law of God, 1 John 1, 4, separates us from him, and his forgiveness is a missing of the high mark or standard that God has set forth for man. This standard, a holy standard, and God desires that we understand not only the consequences of sin, Romans 6.23, but also the fact that when we fail to abide by our commitment, our confession of faith, we can, with repentance, find a loving God ready to shower us with his love and mercy. This understanding is crucial to our coming before him with a humble mind and sincere spirit. He demands and gives assurance that his faithfulness to forgiveness is unquestionable. But there are some who are resistant to repentance. The people that you have taught, there are people that you have, have given your time and efforts to who would not repent of sin, would not obey that form of doctrine, and there are members of the Lord's body whom elders have no doubt prayed and wept over, who in their attempts to bring them back to the Lord have refused to obey and continue down the path of willful resistance toward perdition. 
One who will not repent challenges the authority of God to require it and exposes a haughty and regressive spirit. We can think of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, chapter 5 and verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Isn't that what people are saying when they refuse to accept the gospel? Who is God that I should obey him? It's a representation of ignorance and self-deception and an ungovernable arrogance. If we were to ask why Adam and Eve sin, why does man sin at all today? What drove Cain to kill his brother? The Bible clearly explains it, 1 John 3 and verse 12. Because evil despises righteousness. We live in a world where that is more and more true and obvious every day. The discussion of the attack on religion, or more to the point, Christianity. Where lawsuits are flying up all over the country because people do not want their Christian faith, I'll use that term loosely, to have to accept sin. And that is what we are seeing in the country today, the idea of eliminating, removing sin. Oh, for the time when there is no time. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, appreciate that good lesson, Brother Johnny. You know, um, I'll just, uh, while I'm going to make this remark to our young Christians, uh, of course it applies to all of us because we're all Christians. But uh, in this, uh, the theme of this lectureship, of course, is what must a Christian do to remain faithful to Christ? And uh, Johnny just gave you one of the biggest things. It's, it's all well and good that you have come to a knowledge of the truth, that you've repented of your sins, that you've uh, confessed your, uh, the Lord is Christ, that you've been baptized and have become Christians. But if you sin and you don't repent, it was all for naught. And so this is a key to remaining faithful to Christ to take care of those things in your life when you slip, and you will. So we appreciate that. Now I'm going to combine uh, uh, your lesson with Brother Danny's earlier lesson. <clears throat> Brother Constantine and the Timbuktu School of Preaching. What Dave Miller taught at Brown Trail was error. And that was sin. It was sin when he did it. It's sin for anybody who practices it today. It'll be sin till the end of time because the Bible, don't you understand it, teaches that it's a sin. And it doesn't matter how long passes by until and unless he repents of that sin as the Bible defines repentance. He's lost. And he's no longer being faithful to Christ. He has demonstrated he does not have a humble heart. He does not evidently have a teachable mind because he understands it better than we do. I'm, I'm sure that's, that seems to be his attitude. And he is not ready to repent of this sin. And I say it with sadness, he's lost. And the Timbuktu School of Preaching that is supporting him is in the same boat as well as all of those who are guilty by association of those that do. This is the key, is our prayer that they would repent and come back and be useful servants in the kingdom. We stand adjourned until our next speaker in about 10 minutes.